Good evening. We're glad that you could join us this evening. I'm Cynthia Jackson Elmore, the Dean of the Honors College, and it's my pleasure to be with you to introduce our panelists for tonight's Sharper Focus Wider Lens discussion on what divides us and what unites us. If you're joining us for the first time, I want to make sure that you're aware that this is an opportunity to bring faculty from various disciplines and professions across campus together to talk about broad topics and engage the community and students and have a way to highlight our superstars. Often we bring in speakers from off campus, they're here with us for a day and leave and there's not an opportunity to engage again. And so we thought it was important to highlight the work that's going on on campus. And in our discussion today, it will be part of MSU's celebration of Project 6050, so we're glad that you could join us. We have with us today Dr. Kayla Hales. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Telecommunication, Information Studies, and Media in the College of Communication, Arts, and Sciences. Her interdisciplinary research is informed by social, behavioral, and technical perspectives that seek to explain social interaction and technology usage. Her ultimate goal is to determine how information and communication technologies can be utilized to improve social welfare and quality of life, focusing on non-platonic relationships and black families. She earned her doctorate at Penn State, her dissertation titled You, Me, and IT, Multimedia Relationships Maintenance in the 21st Century, focused on behaviors individuals enact during computer-mediated communication to maintain their non-platonic relationships. Other research interests include human-computer interaction, human behavior, identity in electronic environments, individual differences, interpersonal relationship processes, motivation, and social media. And afterwards, I'm going to ask her how she stays sane with all of those research topics. Now I present to you Dr. Kayla Hales. So my focus today is on interpersonal relationships and communication and how technology impacts them. So our use of communication technologies influences our interactions with others. And this is obvious because it's embedded in the concept of communication technologies. It assumes that we're using these technologies to interact. But the decisions that we make as we use these technologies has a certain way in which it can either unite us or it can divide us. So recent statistics show that there are three million married couples in the U.S. who live apart. In addition, 25 to 50 percent of college students are currently in long-distance relationships, and 75 percent of them have been in long-distance relationships at some point. So because so many of us are separated by proximity, using these technologies becomes necessary to maintain convenient relationships with those people we can't communicate with so readily. And many people believe that using technologies in relationships has positive impacts. In fact, I asked some participants in one of my research studies what they believed in terms of how technology is impacting them. 63 to 73% of them said they believed the impact was positive and that included on things like relationship quality and satisfaction. One participant even highlighted that the inability to be physically present with her boyfriend caused their relationship to become closer. So in that case, the added distance somehow eliminated a barrier for them. Her logic was basically that when you don't have someone physically in the same space with you, then all you can do is talk. And in talking, you get to know the person on a deeper level and that creates a sense of intimacy. So on the one hand, technology allows people to communicate with others via multiple avenues and potentially learn more about them. But on the other hand, technologies provide more opportunities to avoid people and certain types of interactions that you prefer not to have with them. This quote is a good example of that. Here you have a wife, and she mentions that talking is more work. So for her, when she's separated from her husband, she actually prefers to email him as opposed to talk on the telephone. But in spite of the ability to avoid certain types of communication, 76% of participants said they use communication technology simply because they had a need or desire to interact with someone. But so many people using these technologies 
and focusing on their communication partner, they tend to sometimes pay less attention to those individuals who are physically present with them. Often these people engage in what we call absent presence. So in other words, they're in the same physical space with others, but they're interacting with someone through their communication technologies. This creates a situation where a barrier is bridged and simultaneously created. So in order to demonstrate this, I aggregated various YouTube clips into what I believe summarizes some of the key points about communication technologies and how it impacts us. And as a visual learner myself, I'm hoping that in giving you a visual, because I know more discussion is to come, it will sort of create a powerful atmosphere to inspire you to sort of reflect personally on how you're using communication technologies and how that either creates a bridge or it creates a gap with those individuals that you interact with. socialize with people like you're not cool if you don't have a Twitter well I don't want to be a loser like if you don't have a Twitter or Instagram and you don't have like over 2,000 followers it's like you're a loser out the school so you definitely need a cell phone if you want to you know fit in if your parents refuse to let you have a cell phone what would you do I'd be lost at school like I'd have no friends because I'd be sitting alone like I wouldn't know how to talk to people I can't pass any of my classes without Googling the answers. Mom, I need my phone. I call people and people get weirded out that I called them. I should bring back the phone call. You talk to someone online a lot. You can be super close and make jokes, but when you meet the person, it's so awkward sometimes. Because of cell phones, people became less and less confrontational because now it's like, Oh, we can just send a text. You know, I don't need to talk to them in person. They'll, they'll get the same message. You know, I, I think these things are toxic. I don't, especially for kids. It's just this thing. It's bad. And right. they, they don't look at people when they talk to them, and they don't build the empathy. You know, kids are mean, and it's because they're trying it out. They, they, they look at a kid, and they go, you're fat. And then they see the kid's face scrunch up, and they go, ooh, that doesn't feel good to make a person do that. Right. But they, but they got to start with doing the mean thing. But when they write, you're fat, then they just go, mm, I'm, that was fun. I like it. I've ran into polls so many times because I'm texting when I'm walking to class. If you're going to be texting and walking, I'm a seeing eye person. I can help you walk and text. What's your name? Uh, I'm getting too personal. All right, texters. Everything that's available to do isn't a good idea. There's a culture right now that as soon as they say, hey, you get to do that, I'm going to do it. But there's no sort of like, maybe that's not <laughs> just the constant. Nobody takes in life unless it comes through this. You need to build an ability to just be yourself and not be doing something. That's what the phones yes. are taking away, yes. is the ability to just sit there. So let me wrap up some things that I hope you identified as you were watching the video. First, it's the idea that while we're connecting to individuals through technology who are unable to be present with us, we're simultaneously ignoring the people who are present, even for a brief moment. And this inability to be fully present creates a barrier. This teen says that without her cell phone, she wouldn't be able to communicate. So this is partly because communicating in person is much different than communicating via technology. So when you're writing, you can filter your thoughts, you can be more strategic about what you say. You don't have to be as spontaneous as you would be if you were communicating face to face. Communicating using technology has become the easy way out. And so people no longer have to deal with real emotion. People can find ways to feel connected while they're detached they can embrace the idea of absent presence. Now some people hide behind their technologies, they put up barriers and they keep others out of their space, but in doing so, oftentimes they only limit their ability to grow and to become better versions of themselves. And why do they do that? In part because these technologies are convenient and they support our ability 
to remain connected and be always on. But we must be careful. Technology has become so common that oftentimes we don't think about it. We simply use it, and in using it, it becomes the norm. These technologies change our values, and they change our expectations. We don't push back on things that seem outrageous, and we don't do it because it's convenient. So I'm personally concerned about where we're allowing technology to take us. While research is great because it allows us to understand people's behavior, people need to recognize and care enough about the impacts and be willing to change their behavior. Therefore, it's my belief that rather than technology being the cause of unity or division, it's actually caused by the people themselves. And with that, I'll pass the mic. Great, thank you, Kayla. Next, we will have Dr. Suzanne Evans-Wagner. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Linguistics and German, Germanic, Slavic, Asian, and African Languages in the College of Arts and Letters. She's interested in language variation and change, with a current focus on language change across the lifespan. In addition to recent research on young people's participation in ongoing linguistic change in Philadelphia, she has worked on Montreal French morphology, mor morphology excuse me, and Middle English syntax. She earned her doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Wagner. Um, she's actually not. Oh, she's not. Vielen Dank. Ich habe mich über diese Einladung sehr gefreut, weil ich das Thema dieser Diskussion interessant finde. Not loud enough? Können Sie mich verstehen? Can anyone understand me? Only a tiny bit. A tiny bit. Anyone else at all? Okay. So by speaking German in a context where English is expected, I divided this room. I alienated almost everybody, except for you, and I created common ground with you, we're the minority. So my point is going to be that language unites us, but it also divides us all the time, except that most of the time it's not done in quite such an obvious way as I just did. That's because when somebody speaks, we're listening not only to what they're saying, but how they say it. And you're doing this right now, at this very moment. It takes only a few fractions of a second for us to form an impression of a speaker. Their age, their gender identity, their ethnicity, their social class, their region of origin. Probably before I got to the end of my first sentence, you had determined that I'm not an American. And perhaps you had assumed that I'm originally from Britain. And you would be right. I am from Britain. You might also have speculated from the way that I'm carefully pronouncing my ings in words like pronouncing and not deleting the ends of words like first sentence and not first sentence that I'm maybe middle class and I probably have more rather than less education. And of course, if any of you happen to be British, sadly no, <laughs> you might be able to figure out and even find a grained picture of my social class and my regional background. Now, it's been said that America and Britain are two nations divided by a common language. We speak English on both sides of the Atlantic, but those Englishes are different in large and small ways. Brits say hot and not hot. Bird and not bird. Brits are statistically more likely to say, I've got, instead of I have, in sentences like, I've got two brothers, instead of I have two brothers. Brits are also more likely to say, I've done my homework and not, I did my homework. Brits are more likely to end their sentences with a question like, this is the shirt you want, isn't it? Rather than with some other tag, like, this is the shirt you want, right? And of course, Brits and Americans have entertained one another for generations with gentle misunderstandings over words like fanny, rubber, fag, chaps, and many more innocuous words like pavement, lorry, and petrol. And if any of those words were opaque to you, I guess we'll leave those for the questions. 
But nonetheless, speakers of British English and American English do understand one another almost all the time. Even though our countries are divided by 3,000 miles of ocean and several centuries of history, our dialects actually haven't drifted all that far apart. In fact, we're often participating in the same ongoing language changes in English more generally at the same time and in the same way. So for instance, you've probably heard people using be like to quote themselves or other people, as in, I was like, you're joking, and she was like, I'm not. Perhaps this is even something that you do yourself. In fact, you probably do. This new way of quoting has swept through millions of native speakers of English around the globe in just three generations, despite the fact that very few of those millions have ever interacted with each other. So how can English or any language be so different and so similar at the same time? Why is language both a unifying force and a dividing force? On the one hand, the ability to learn and create language is unifying, it's universal. Children all learn their native language not by robotically parroting exactly what they hear, but by figuring out patterns and applying rules. This is why children say swimmed and runned for a while, until they notice that there are exceptions to that rule and they have to be learned separately. It's also why children can figure out the missing parts in sentences, especially when we use shortcuts. So if I say, I love you, and daddy does too, the child has to figure out that does means loves you. It's also why children can produce their own completely novel utterances. Right? They don't just reproduce what we say, they come up with new things on their own. And if they couldn't, we'd be robbed of all sorts of gems, like the things my four-year-old says, like, and this is a real thing, I'm a pirate dog called Woofo. And I'm pretty sure he was the first human ever to have uttered that sentence. <laughs> but on the other hand, of course, not all humans are the same. We share this language ability, but we use it in different ways. So this is reflected both in the ways that we use language, as I said, and the ways that we perceive language. Sometimes the differences in use are actually very subtle. So as I've already hinted, they're sometimes gradient rather than absolute. So in North American English, for instance, young people are more likely to modify adjectives with so, as in so fast, so pretty, whereas older people are more likely to use really or very. So we all use the same set of modifiers, but the frequency is different in different age groups. African Americans are more likely than whites to use the had form of the past for simple past uses, as in you had called to make a reservation, instead of you called to make a reservation. Gay men are more likely than straight men to produce quite long bursts in their T's when they release them, so right instead of right. Language is a reflection then of our differences at these group levels, right? The levels of class and ethnicity and so forth. But it's also the outcome of our often unconscious efforts to identify actively as members of those groups. And in some work that I have been doing in Philadelphia, I found that young Irish American and Italian American women had slightly different ways of pronouncing the vowel in words like fight and life. So most Philadelphians will say something like fight and life, with varying degrees of extremeness depending on their backgrounds. And among the young women that I was studying, the women who most strongly identified themselves as Irish American, as members of a peer group in their high school, that thought of themselves as being Irish above all things, were using more extreme pronunciations of this vowel than the young women who thought of themselves as Italian. And language also divides us at the individual level. In more recent work, my students and I have been examining language perception. In general, listeners from the same community make the same judgments about speakers. As I mentioned earlier, people generally think that someone sounds more educated and more formal if they say running and pronouncing instead of running and pronouncing. People also usually think that someone sounds less intelligent if they say like a lot, as in, I'm like trying like hard to not like say like. <laughs> but there's some variation among how individual listeners process and perceive and judge this kind of language and how quickly they make their judgments, and whether or not they revise those judgments after the first few instances of forming an impression. So we measured this using some tests of personality and cognitive processing style to figure out how all the individuals in our sample were behaving. 
And we found, for instance, that listeners with low social aptitude will hear a like user as more intelligent than listeners who have low social aptitude. Okay, so their social judgments about these features are very different. People with low social aptitude also tend to hear the in pronunciation of ing as more professional sounding than people with high social aptitude. And these results hold even when we take into account listeners' group characteristics, like their sex, their ethnicity, or their social class. So to summarize, humans are unified in their ability to learn and use language. Right? It's a universal that, as Kayla said, we used to communicate. It, it brings us together. And although there are many differences of structure, vocabulary, and pronunciation across and within languages, on the whole, everyday communication happens without too much difficulty. That leaves us free to exploit the many differences for social purposes, creating both social distance and social solidarity. Thank you, Suzanne. It's now my privilege to introduce to you Dr. Chuck Ostrom, Jr. He's a professor and chair of the Department of Political Science in the College of Social Science. His current professional interests are focused on US trial courts. Ostrom's work focuses on criminal sentencing, racial discrimination, trial court culture, judicial workload, and court performance. The aforementioned work has been funded by the National Institute of Justice and he earned his doctorate from Indiana University, and he also has the oddity of being one of the few people I have known my entire career here at MSU. Um, I actually stepped into a class that he was a legend in and, and had to follow him, so it's interesting how our paths have continued to cross. All right, thank you, Cynthia. Um, so, as, as in her short bio, I mean, she talked a little bit about the stuff I've done public opinion and the first thing that happened when I heard about the, the topic about what divides us and what unites us is this whole idea of political polarization and we see you know evidence of this divergence of political attitudes to very wide extremes and it strikes me that climate change is a really high stakes example of a public policy issue by, for which there is very divergent opinion. Now, within the last two months, uh, the AAAS, the American Academy for the Advancement of Science, and the IPCC have released uh, reports. And the AAAS, in uh, just a, three weeks or so ago, decided that as the number, as the largest scientific organization in the world, they needed to speak out on climate change, and to, and note that 97% of climate scientists agree that climate change is happening that in fact humans are driving climate change and that there's a great deal of risk associated with doing nothing. And the sooner we act, the lower the risk and cost. Now the IPCC uh, about a, 10 days ago uh, issued a draft of their fifth report, which is a very techni technical and scientific uh, treatise in comparison to the AAAS, but what they're trying to do is to highlight what the risks are for both human and natural systems. And that risk assessment, from their perspective, we need to answer you know, basically three questions. What's the probability that climate change is happening? Second, what impacts are likely to occur if we do nothing to curb the climate change? And then third, if we act, what can we do to mitigate those impacts. Now, there is a threat gap. So here's some data from the Gallup poll uh, over the last 16 years, which shows two things of interest. First of all, only two out of every three people, 65% or so, think that um, global warming is happening. But the remarkable thing is about only 36% of people think it'll be a problem in their lifetime. Most of those people probably haven't been to Montana to what used to be called Glacier National Park. Um, and in a couple of years, there won't be any glaciers. The second thing of, of terms of cause, that only 57% of the US public believes that human activities have contributed to global warming 
whereas 40% think it's just part of natural variation. Now, the interesting thing here is that if, it's, if human activity is the cause, then we could do something about it. That is, we could, we could develop policy to mitigate impacts through government controls and various sorts of policy. So we get a divide on that. But what is most troubling, I think, is the degree to which there are partisan divides over cause. So that 80% of Democrats and only 40% of Republicans believe that the rise in human temperature is caused by human activity. Independence uh, at 50% closer to the Republicans. So we find this incredible divide in the, in the population. Now, in the fall, I happened to be invited to a, an event at James Madison to hear a, I believe a former Honors College student and James Madison graduate, Anthony Leiserwitz, talk about his project at the, on the Yale, at, that, he, that he runs out of Yale and George Mason. And what Tony says is that it's not a bipolar polarization like this graph suggests, but that he has been writing now for three or four years on what he calls the six Americans, that there are in fact six groups within the population ranging from those people on, the, on your left who are alarmed versus people who are dismissive. And the interesting thing about the distribution is that it's relatively flat, okay? So that there are almost as many people who are doubtful and dismissive as there are who are alarmed and concerned. And interestingly, in those six groups, what brings those people together isn't sex, race, age, or income, but it turns out that it's political ideology and underlying world views. So that it's in fact, the world views are the way we, the way we look at things and make sense out of it and construe the world that in fact creates some problems. So it's a, in, a, in a simplification, I'd like to introduce two different world views. One which we could call a dominant social paradigm, I think, which is um, representative of neoliberal philosophy where we say that you know what we want is that we just want a, a laissez-faire economy where price governs, we want minimal controls, we want maximal growth, and if we screw up, science and technology will figure out how to deal with it, and basically we don't need to worry about nature because we're separate from that. An alternative, or the, what is called the new ecological paradigm, is that price doesn't always work, maybe seldom does, that we do need government controls, that we need to be focused on sustainability and faith in science and, and a stewardship of nature. So I would argue then that what it comes down to, what's dividing us, is basically a focus on government control and the whole notion of economic growth. And that's what we, you know, you could call that the carbon uh, battleground. And so uh, the Yale folks have a new paper out that's coming out in December, and I happened to get a copy of it, and they sent me this, this diagram, which is the centerpiece of the paper, and it, and it makes two points. The slanted line moving from left to right represents the degree to which people believe the science. So the alarmed people believe what science says. So they believe AAAS, they believe the IPCC. People on the far right dismiss it. Now, the curved line in the middle represents how actively involved they are with the issues. So the people who are alarmed and concerned, they're active and involved. The people who are doubtful and dismissive are involved, but they're involved in a different way. They're counter-arguing, they have motivated reasoning, and they're very, and both ends are very unlikely to change their beliefs. And I think we, we see some of this in the, in the discussion of Obamacare, but that the fact is that there are these different beliefs, and one side thinks reducing carbon uh, emissions will save the planet, and the other views it as just an excuse for governmental controls and undermining economic growth. And why would we want that? Okay? As James Watt famously said, it won't matter, be, no, I can't say that. Anyway, the, uh, 
need to watch myself. But the one success that we've had in the environmental era has been the Montreal Protocol. Interestingly, brokered and lead, led to a great extent by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, which reminded me that if a, a conservative, it takes a conservative to actually be able to have leadership for the entire country on the issue of the environment, just like it took Richard Nixon, a conservative, to open the door to China in the mid-70s. And I'll just close with, put this graphic up. In America, the, and ideology is in the U.S. is a primary, uh, a primary predictor of what your opinion on global warming will be. Not so in the rest of the world. And in fact, in the U.S., we're more concerned with uh, Iran, North Korea, political instability in Pakistan than we are with something that uh, has the potential to have pretty serious consequences for the rest of the world. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chuck. And next we're gonna hear from Dr. Daniel Kramer. He holds a joint appointment as an associate professor in James Madison College and the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife in the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. His research examines the social, economic, and policy aspects of conservation. Recently, he has researched the role of social capital in the stewardship activities of lake associations. Kramer's teaching interests include domestic and international environmental policy, sustainable development, globalization and the environment, the social, economic, and policy aspects of conservation biology, game theory, and qualitative methods, quantitative methods. He earned his doctorate from the University of Minnesota. Thank you. So as an introduction to my general research interest, I want to present this map. Um, the map, what it shows is the travel time from every point on Earth to the nearest city of 50,000 people or more in days. So you can see that the light yellow areas are less remote and then the very dark red and orange areas are quite remote. And you can see that there are probably no surprises there. The Amazon region, for example, is, is dark red, orange, uh, the, the Himalayan region, the Arctic, uh, the Saharan Desert, those are very remote places. As a conservation biologist, and for those of you that don't know what that is, I study the process of extinction and try to think of clever ways to prevent species extinction. As a conservation biologist, I'm keenly aware of the debate over whether pristine places, pristine landscapes exist anymore, or whether restoring to conditions of pristine ought to be our goal as a society. What is not debated, however, is the fact that very remote places still exist on Earth. And as a whole, these places tend to be more biologically diverse than less remote places. And just as we have lost pristine, we are increasingly losing remoteness through the processes of globalization. And this is what I study. An example of this loss of remoteness is on the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua, where I've been doing research for the past eight years. This is how one travel guide described that area, the area in which I work, in 2005. So if the question tonight that we are considering is what unites us and what divides us, my answer is a road. In 2007, with funding from a Japanese aid agency, the central government of Nicaragua constructed a road from the central interior city of Rama to the small little village of Pearl Lagoon on the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua. To give you a sense sort of how that changed that region, when I was visiting this area in 2006, prior to the construction of that road, to get to Pearl Lagoon from the capital of Managua, which I flew into, it would take me probably two to three days. And if I wanted to go a little farther no north to some of the more remote communities, it might take me four to five, maybe even six days. With the road, I can get a bus in Managua and get to Pearl Lagoon in five hours if the road hasn't been washed out because of rain. As far as roads go, by the way, this is an, another planned project uh, to the south, also a, a new road, not yet built, but planned. So as far as roads go, this one is not much of one. Uh, this is the road during construction. It has only two lanes, it's gravel, and it's often washed out during the rainy season. The road does, however, 
effectively connect this very remote region of Nicaragua to the more populous urban Pacific side, and therefore to the world beyond as well. This is an aerial shot of the road cut through the rainforest and into that small community of Pearl Lagoon on the coast. Change is often greeted with a mixture of hope and fear. I think that's human nature. And this road was received in a similar way by the people of the Atlantic coast. They call themselves Costanians. So these are a few pictures of some of the communities that I work in. Uh, Nicaragua, if you don't know, is the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. But this road has created some opportunities as well as some dangers. Opportunities for diversifying livelihoods beyond subsistence farming and fishing, maybe perhaps through more tourism and perhaps through new markets. The people of the Atlantic coast increasingly have greater access to the technologies that we all take for granted, running water, electricity, satellite TVs, mobile phones, and this road has made travel throughout the region less costly and far easier. Nicaragua is a wonderfully diverse ecologically country. Uh, it contains that on the upper left-hand corner, that's a pine savanna forest, pine trees, uh, in the southern hemisphere, it's quite remarkable, in, in near the equator. Uh, the top right is lowland tropical rainforest. The bottom left are mangrove forests, and then the bottom right are these wonderful coral key islands off the coast of Nicaragua. So while a conservation biologist such as myself might study the direct effects of a road, and the effects of that road on biodiversity, that is, the road destroys habitat when you make it, the road divides habitat, I'm more interested in the indirect effects, that is, what comes down the road. So specifically, the question that I'm asking in Nicaragua is how does increasing market access, increasing access to technology, and increasing migration affect coastal people's relationship with their natural environment? Before I describe some of these effects, uh, I wanted to show you a few pictures from the camera traps that we use to try to document the terrestrial wildlife around the villages that we're studying. So Bard's tapir is in the upper left. Uh, that species was considered extinct in Nicaragua prior to our work there. Locals always knew it was there, but our cameras picked it up and uh, it was kind of a big deal for us. The jaguar, of course, is a very charismatic species. Uh, and is also present in abundance in the rainforest of Nicaragua. And then the giant anteater, which is, you don't get much of a picture of it, but it's the first scientific documented evidence of the giant anteater in Nicaragua in over 80 years. So an important part of this story about a road that may unite and may, may divide is the historical, the economic, the political, and the cultural isolation of the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua. The, the, coast, the coast is known as the land of five faces. So you have two indigenous, three indigenous people, Mosquito, Sumu, and Rama Indians. And then you also have Afro-Caribbean populations, and then increasingly a Mestizo population migrating from the Pacific side of the country. The Pacific side of the country was colonized by the Spanish. The English colonized the Atlantic side. And that division still exists today. After the Civil War in Nicaragua in the 1980s, the central government, through a series of national laws and constitutional amendments, granted the two Caribbean provinces some degree of autonomy, including autonomy over their land and their natural resources. At the very least, however, this new road has complicated local control over their natural resources and, in fact, may undermine local autonomy. So markets have popped up. Uh, this shows a picture of people bringing produce into this region from Managua, and then people leaving with trucks and coolers and taking fish out of that region. We're worried that the nature of agriculture would change in that area. Perhaps farmers using greater inputs, perhaps planting crops that are more acceptable in the market, but perhaps less suitable ecologically for that reason, for that region. New markets have popped up that didn't exist before. So this is after the road. Asian buyers have come to buy blue crab and rosewood and shark fin and jellyfish, things that local people had never harvested before, but now there's a market for it. Migration is a big issue for the people on the Atlantic coast. Um, I had mentioned that the, the laws and the changes in the Constitution had given this, these people greater autonomy. And part of that process 
was starting the process of demarcation, land demarcation. So trying to figure out the boundaries of traditional communal lands. The, the demarcation process is not complete, but when you throw in growing market incentives and this relentless mestizo migration from the Pacific side of the country, it's creating some very difficult uh, and, try, and trying times trying to sort out demarcation. And lastly, technology. Technology offers both good things and bad things, as other people on this panel have mentioned. It can make our lives much easier. It can make our lives more productive. It can, it can improve health. It can also change our relationship with our natural environment, allowing us to exploit natural resources with more efficiency. So here's an electrical line going into one of those communities that I study. This is a meter put on one of the houses. Satellite dish, more and more you see this in those communities. A cell phone tower. And then finally, my, the, the greatest sort of uh, example of technology, a speed bump. So the situation that I've described in the Atlantic coast is not unusual. We are continually expanding infrastructure, including roads into the Amazon, the Arctic, Borneo, the Congo, northwestern China, and dozens of other remote places. This loss of remoteness carries with it both peril and promise. The point is, is that we can do better. We can do better than building a road into a remote area and then hoping for the best. To do better, we need to understand the complex interactions between human and natural systems in rapidly globalizing area and the effects that these interactions have on people and the natural world. Thank you, Dan. And we will also now hear from Dr. Sean Velez. He holds a joint appointment in, as an assistant professor in Lyman Briggs College and the Department of Philosophy in the College of Arts and Letters. His research is primarily in the history and philosophy of the biomedical sciences, especially medical genetics. Particular topics of, of his research include what it means to be a genetic disease carrier, the history of American and British eugenics programs, and how they relate to later biomedical science, the ethics of genetic testing and genetic engineering, and the adaptation in biomedicine. He earned his doctorate from Indiana University. So as you may have noticed from my, uh, from my interest side, of course, like everyone else in this group, um, come at this from a different angle. And I suppose that's the point. And uh, from my disciplinary background, we like to start every good story with Charles Darwin. <laughs> so a couple years before Darwin published The Origin of Species, where he famously laid out the um, uh, evolution by natural selection, he was having a conversation with another scientist, John Hooker. And they were having a sort of a classic debate in the world of taxonomy but how do you draw the line between one species and another? So if I, for example, look out in my backyard and I see a group of birds that all look roughly similar, I, I can look very carefully and try to find differences among them and try to say, actually, I think I see three species of birds there. These ones have a slightly different color on their back. These ones have slightly longer wings. And these ones have a slightly different, different shape of head. Or I could say they're actually pretty close and I'm gonna call them one species. And so this, is, um, this has been a, this was a problem in Darwin's time, it's a problem in our time as well, because there aren't obvious, obvious boundaries in the natural world, or especially in the biological world. And so Darwin, in a sense, sort of threw up his hands and said, you know, you can either be a lumper or a splitter. You can either just lump things together because they seem close enough, or you can split them apart because they seem different enough. And there's no principled answer to, as to which one is the correct one. We have to make our, essentially, decisions on a case-by-case -case basis about when things are similar enough to call them the same, and when they're different enough to call them different. And so the same issue comes up inside the biomedical world when we're trying to decide when are populations similar enough that we give them the same medical advice, and when are they different enough that we say that they should get different medical advice. So I'm gonna very briefly review a couple of the issues that I've talked about in my own research, uh, because it can have very serious consequences. So take, for example, the way that the biomedical world will sometimes lump together white people. So here's a set of recommendations from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, one of the most, uh, one of the largest and most influential medical associations in America. And they're giving the advice, they're giving advice to physicians to give to their patients um, who might want to go under, undergo genetic testing to find out whether they're carriers for the recessive genetic, genetic disease, cystic fibrosis. So this is a terrible uh, lung disease, especially 
this, this fatal. Um, people who carry one copy of the gene are asymptomatic, they don't have any effects at all. And if you carry two copies of it though, then you, t then you will have the uh, genetic disease cystic fibrosis. So this is the rate of carriers for this one recessive gene. And looking around this room, there's probably about one. Um, I'm not sure if you know who you are, but somebody does. <laughs> Actually, nobody has any idea who it is. <laughs> so um, so this, this, this advice says that non-Hispanic whites have a carrier rate of one in 25. So one out of every 25 people carries this gene. Okay, fair enough. Well, when you, call, when you talk about white people, you don't always talk about all white people. So for example, the, the Finnish population, people for, with ancestry from Finland, they don't have a carrier rate of one in 25. They have a carrier rate of one in 77. And so you have this advice being put out for people, for, for example, a couple that might want to undergo genetic testing before having a child. They would say, well, you know, we're white, maybe we should get tested for this. Well, nobody tells them that if they're finished, the odds that they should actually go undergo testing, they would actually get almost no benefit from it, a one in 77 carrier risk. That's three times lower. But nobody tells them, including the medical guidelines, because instead we talk about white people as a whole. We lump. And the same thing happens when, uh, when the government is recently making, a, making a dietary recommendations for all Americans, and they set aside a separate category for African Americans. So to a, couple, a few years ago, the government said, um, basically everyone should eat a reduced salt diet. Americans eat way too much salt. So everyone should reduce their, their, di their dietary salts every day to 2,300 milligrams or less. And if you meet any of these certain criteria for high risk, then you should have an even lower salt diet in order to reduce rates of hypertension in the United States, high, high blood pressure. So they, should, they say you should have an extra low salt diet if you already have hypertension, makes sense. If you're diabetic, if you have chronic kidney disease, or if you're African American. And so immediately you have this representation of African Americanness as this risk factor for being, for essentially getting hypertension. And if you look as a whole, if you lump together all of the studies inside, you know, done inside the United States, you'll see that there are high rates of hypertension in the African American community. Fair enough, sort of. What you don't have represented is that people who are African American, in the sense of from Africa and become American, they have entirely different medical experiences. So foreign born non-Hispanic blacks have lower hypertension rates than US born blacks. And actually, they have lower rates of hypertension than US born non-Hispanic whites. So you have, you have government guidelines that say African Americans are at extra high risk, when in fact there's a subpopulation that has been well established within Within that, so within that population, it's actually at extra low risk. Maybe you need more salt, I don't know. <laughs> and actually, if you adjust for income, age, and some other demographic factors, black immigrants had 55% lower mortality from cardiovascular disease than US born whites. And so, what exactly is African Americanness a risk of? Well, apparently, it helps sometimes. And, and all of this goes into the, to the background question that's never discussed inside these guidelines of who is African American and who's African and who's American. There might be a difference between black and African American when it comes to immigrants, and that's a conversation that could have been had and wasn't. And so here we are not having it. So ultimately, we have, a, we have this question of, well, when exactly should we lump people together and when should we split them apart? When should we talk about white people and when should we talk about African Americans? Or when should we talk about white people, asterisk, not Finns? or African Americans, it's an asterisk, as long as you're born in the US. And so these, these are questions, like Darwin was essentially saying um, all that time ago, that it doesn't really have a principled answer, that we have, to make, we have to make judgment calls, and some of it's gonna be a matter of intuition. I think he was sort of saying that there are sort of people by habit who are lumpers or hair splitters. And even aside from, the, even from, aside from matters of habit, if you wanna get into, more, uh, into a more careful, just, uh, careful distinctions as far as what well, we need to make guidelines, how do we decide when the right lumping is happening or when the right splitting is happening. Um, ultimately, we have to make decisions about what our interests are. So what is the purpose of giving guidelines for who's at risk for cystic fibrosis or for hypertension? If it's to respect the interests and the needs of, the, of all the populations being represented, then we shouldn't be ignoring people of Finnish ancestry or foreign born African Americans and so when it comes to certain situations, there can be a, a principled answer if we have certain values that we want to espouse. 
And so um, these are questions, these are issues that we have, we have to figure out and we have to make hard decisions about them. And ultimately, I think the best way forward is to just talk about these issues. We should talk about what unites us and what divides us. Um, it's the only way that I think actually helps um, because just throwing out guidelines out there and having people read them, it, 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 it often doesn't help. So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you, Sean. Um, I'm gonna offer some observations across the different presentations and then allow the panelists if they have things that they wanna comment on about what they've heard from each other. And then we'll open it up to the floor. When we open up to the floor, my partner in crime, um, John Beckwell, um, field questions and also come up with some additional ones. But as I listened, I, I tried to listen for ideas that also harken back to what goes into Project 6050 and the whole idea of the Civil Rights Act and Brown versus Board of Education and, and some themes that might be underlying that. And as Kayla was talking about technology, one of the things that kept coming to mind is issues of access. And over time, that's been diminished somewhat, but you still have issues across subpopulations and, and regions of the country, and what does that mean, just in, even in terms of income level? And so as technology has the ability to bring us together, it also can divide us. And this, this whole idea that whether or not I have access and whether or not I have the latest technology can also go back to issues of whether or not I'm quote unquote worthy, right? And, and do I have what it takes to be a part of the game and a part of the discussion? And, and as Suzanne was talking, and the whole idea about language and not just the words themselves, but the dialects and how we use different phrases and, and what that signals to people about whether we belong or not or whether we're worthy. And even the whole idea that in this country we had whole segments of the population who weren't supposed to be educated by law. And then when we said that they could be educated, well, the education wasn't quite equal. And now we agree that maybe it should be equal and yet we finance schools differently. And so we, we understand that the language issue, even within a given dialect or language, is still something that divides us. And as Chuck was talking about political polarization and public opinion, I mean, that's one that really harkens to the heart of how do we even get the laws passed? And what did it take to get enough sway in public opinion to make the elected officials step up and do what some might say is the right thing? You know, they both were cases where it really took not just the opinion leaders, but enough of society to say enough is enough and, and we're going to try to change things. And as Dan was talking about biological and ecological diversity, what kept coming to mind is the importance of valuing all forms of life in all types of people, right? And, and this, this idea that even the road, I think about communities that were destroyed just by how a road was put in and a conscious choice to say that we are gonna disrupt your lifestyle because we don't believe that you're deserving of an opportunity to thrive. And what can that mean? And again, how the road was symbolism of you can move forward or we can not just hold you back, but throw you back. You may have been more organized than all the other communities, but we're gonna step in and interrupt that. And when Sean was talking and he started with Darwin, um, I have to admit that there was a little bit of a knee jerk reaction because survival of the fittest was the underlying argument for much of what happened to the black people in this country, right? The whole idea that somehow blacks were different and, and less, not even less qualified, but maybe not even really human. And if you are human, so, you know, not at the same level as everyone else. And the whole idea of subjugation of select groups and then the lumping together. You know, it's a different version of stereotyping, right? Everybody that fits this particular description is the same. And I looked at the panel and I said, okay, so if we hadn't had the Civil Rights Act passed, which then allowed for women's rights to really move forward, and we hadn't had Brown versus Board of Education, you actually wouldn't have this panel. Half the panel is female. A third of the panel is apparently, just by looks, black. And one sixth of the panel is by what we know of a different nationality. And the idea that we could get up here and be together, be equals, and talking about these various subjects wouldn't even be possible if it hadn't been for the pioneering acts 
that took place. And so what does that say to us about not just what's accomplished, but what's still yet to be done? What barriers are we pretending aren't in the room that we need to break down as we continue to move forward? So, so just some organizing things as I thought across and I, I wanted to be true to, you know, someone really did have to step out there and say, you know, we really do need to give a whole set of people rights that we've denied them. And, and someone had to say, yes, we should be educating all people and lifting it up and lifting up society. And so I, I want to take a moment and see if the panelists, if you had thoughts or reactions to what you heard from each other. Um, and if not, then we'll turn it over to John, but to the panelists. I'll say something that you uh, touched on that I think is a, a really important lesson, uh, Cynthia mentioning. And, you know, I, I was talking about the fact that Reagan and Thatcher were critical to the Montreal Protocols and Nixon to China, but probably in terms of what Cynthia is talking about in, in, the, in the, uh, the basic underlying theme this year is what it took to pass the War on Poverty, the Voting Rights Act, and the Civil Rights Act. It took a Southern congressman who became president, somebody who could marshal the, the power of the status quo and lead them away from where they were. So I think we have, in this country, we have a very strong status quo bias. So however the dice get rolled, we are where we are, and we want to move somewhere, there's always been polarization. There's polarization around climate change. There certainly was polarization around Red China and Taiwan. The clear, you know, the, the, the 50th anniversary of, you know, what happened in 1964, 1965 um, shows that I think that, you know, certain times there are people who are able to break that status quo. And very often there are people who in some way are identified with the primary characteristics of those in the status quo. I'm on. Okay, good. Um, so I was thinking, um, Cynthia, about what you said about civil rights and uh, language prejudice. So um, Chuck mentioned the status quo, mm -hmm. right? And um, one way that I could have gone with my talk this evening was um, to talk about standards versus diversity. So one way in which we are united in the way that we speak is that we have some sort of consensus about what the standard way of speaking is or the standard way of writing. But of course, speakers are incredibly diverse. There are lots and lots of different ways of producing American English. There are lots of ways of producing African American English. There are lots of different ways of producing Michigan English. <clears throat> but we agree upon some sort of common expectation for what the standard is which makes us often very intolerant of anything that doesn't look like the standard. And that is, I think, where lots of these um, uh, social divisions get reflected through linguistic divisions, and as you mentioned, through political divisions that relate to language. And there have been lots of um, landmark and very interesting cases involving African-American students in particular and prejudice against them in schools as a result of them speaking what linguists would consider to be a perfectly legitimate language and a perfectly legitimate dialect of English, but is so very different from standard American English that people tend to see this as a problem and something that should be stamped out. So I was thinking about, um, about language prejudice as being one of these last remaining prejudices, as you mentioned, um, and how, the other, as I said, the other way I could have gone with this is to talk about how language brings us together through some very important need to communicate. It's important that we all have some access to the standard, and you mentioned access to. Um, but we need to recognize diversity, and I think this was something that everybody talked about to one degree or another. And this is something that, as a sociolinguist, although my primary interest is in simply observing and measuring and reporting, we have a sort of ethical mission to help society understand that linguistic diversity is just as precious as biological diversity.
So while John is trying to get his mic on, I um, want to make sure if you have questions to go ahead and raise your hand. He'll, he'll make his way to you and actually Dan has something that he wants to weigh in on. Yeah, just really quickly, I thought it yeah, interesting we're talking about language diversity and biological diversity. There's some really great work that shows if you look globally, there's this really profound overlap between biological diversity and language linguistic diversity. Uh, so if you kind of put two maps and overlay them on top of each other, the same places where you have very rich biological diversity, you tend to have very rich language diversity. And so thinking about why that might be is kind of an interesting uh, thought experiment. Yeah, it's, um, so it's sometimes the case in a place like Papua New Guinea, for instance, which is um, recognized to be one of the most linguistically diverse places on Earth, that that is a place that has been isolated for a long time and where there are pockets of the country that are extremely geographically isolated, so you need separation in order to create that kind of diversity, absolutely. That said, what we also see in major cities is amazing diversity and wealth of dialect uh, difference as well. So um, coming back to your point about biological diversity, um, I was going to mention that, of course, the pitfall of this overlap is that um, in the 19th century, for instance, um, colonial, European colonial occupying powers in Africa, for example, based their nation state boundaries on what they perceived to be linguistic boundaries. So they would say, well, you speak this language, you belong to this race, everybody in this, of this race is now in this pocket of the country or in this part of the country. And that, of course, as we know, has had all kinds of devastating effects uh, through the centuries. So we have to be very careful with that overlap. Well, we actually got the mic together. I'm gonna to see some hands go up. I already saw one. But let me hit you with a quick question. When we put this panel together, what we were trying to get at is that there are new solidarities and there are new cleavages. So the solidarity, for example, globalization suddenly treats us all the same. Um, so does climate change uh, in, in some ways, and it also uh, creates cleavages in, in other ways. One way of uh, perhaps uh, throwing it back on all of you as a panel, and maybe really starting with Kayla, is it's been said that maybe we're, we're atomizing, that is, uh, that we're getting down to the point where we position ourselves in relation to all the things that make us unique, so that we're creating kind of a, a new, unbelievably hyper-individuality. On the other side, it very well may be that we have uh, hyper-solidarity, you know, that we now, for example, through social media, can reach out to the other six people that like the same game that we like that was only played in medieval days or something else, right? So that it's interesting in terms of the kinds of changes that we're seeing in relation to social media and the other things in terms of who is, who is like me and who is different than me. Who is us and who is them comes up with whole new definitions. So. Please, uh, I'll put that in the form of a question after that comment, then I'm going to hand the microphone. And unfortunately, this seems to be giving us reverb, right? Is that what I'm hearing? So maybe put it way down low. Okay. Anyone want to get into that? I'm just going to add a comment here because one of the things I almost talked about was this idea of how technology is changing how we actually identify who we are as individuals. And so it's this notion that because I can communicate in these spaces where I can't be seen or people don't necessarily know who I really am, I can create these new identities who aren't who I am at all. So it's not only that you know we're sort of trying to be individuals and be different, we're, we're trying to be new. We're trying to be people we aren't simply because we can, because it's, it's easier to hide behind the technologies. So in social media, for example, we can, I won't use Facebook, but it's usually on Facebook you're connected with your friends and they know who you are. But if you're using something different, let's say Twitter, let's say you're using Instagram, you have the opportunity there to sort of express different aspects of yourself or create new aspects of yourself because those people don't necessarily know you or have an idea of who your identity is. Hi, my name is Florence, and I'm a sophomore here at MSU. Um, thank you to all of you for being a part of this panel. It was a really interesting discussion. Um, my question is primarily for Dr. Wagner. 
it, your perspective on like the language prejudice was really interesting. And I have a question. I'm not sure if you can answer it, but like nowadays amongst young people, especially if there's a black student who speaks quote unquote properly, they're deemed as talking white. And then if there's a white student who speaks like in African American vernacular for like various reasons like environment or the school they're in or whatever, and they're talking black, like how do you think that factors into the language prejudice and how can we like get rid of that? Can it ever go away? Um, so, so you're asking, how can we get rid of that prejudice? How can we get rid of the, the way that we criticize one another when we speak? And particularly, these cases are where you appear to be crossing ethnic boundaries. Is that what you mean? <clears throat> I don't know that we can ever get rid of it. Right? I think it's, it's part of human nature to make these judgments. We know that people, as I said, make them very, very quickly. Um, and they come absolutely from a social place rather than a linguistic place. Um, I also think that it's human to have quite strong ideas about authenticity, mm -hmm. and that's what you're getting at here. So who is who can legitimately speak a certain way, and who can not legit who is not licensed to talk in that way? Um, and that goes not just for people who sound like they're talking black when they're not black, or sound like they're white when they're not white, but people who are attempting to sound working class when they're not. Right? We care about this when politicians do it. So Hillary Clinton on the campaign trail was a very good example of this when she was running for the Democratic um, position on the ticket. So um, it was said in the press that she used a lot of this in pronunciation that um, I mentioned earlier, and particularly when she was talking to Southern audiences. So whether she intended to do this or not, she did it. Um, and we you can definitely hear it from those recordings. But she was challenged in the press for not being authentic, right? for sounding like something she wasn't real and trying to be folksy, which is not really a folksy person. Um, so I think fundamentally these things just don't go away. And even if they did, we'd find other ways to criticize one another. Right? We pay attention to one another's clothing and walk and tastes in music. But what I do think we can do is raise some more awareness of this. Now, what I have noticed, even in the last 10 years, is that media reporting on language variation has got better. It's, there, is, there are more intelligent voices out there reporting what's actually happening and drawing attention to some of the issues that we've mentioned, rather than just knee-jerk complaining about bad grammar today. And you still get that, but we're also getting more measured understanding of not only the fact that variation is present in language, but also the social damage it can do if we allow it to become too important. So I wish I could sound more positive, but I do think that um, we're getting there, right? We're, we're, we're linguists, at least, are trying very hard to bring these sorts of issues to people's attention. And I think the media is beginning to listen to us. So the echo chamber will, and maybe social media will work for us eventually. And what's interesting is it's not today's youth. This is not a, a new problem that's unique to your generation. It, it's been around for quite a while in terms of you know, whether or not you are within the right race or class when you speak. Okay, I have three comments. First, um, Dr. Hales, I wonder if you know that um, IT can divide us too, because I know women who go to single stances and you know they exchange emails with a guy, and then the discovery doesn't know the first thing about spelling and grammar, and he's toast right away. Okay, and then uh, Dr. Wagner, I wonder if you noticed that people are very diverse in their ability to adjust their language. So when I was serving some young probationers in Lansing, I could get greater probability if I talked about shooting hoops in the hood with the homies. Okay, and people who move in the UP suddenly start ending every sentence with a. You agree, eh? Right. <laughs> um, and uh, Dr. Dan, whatever it was, <laughs> sorry. Did you notice that <laughs> when they were building the interstate, how that really, um, you know, it created suburbs and commuters and uh, just terrible, terrible environmental stuff? Um, and, you know, they mowed down paradise in, in Detroit and destroyed a very healthy neighborhood. You know, there's so many effects of being able to get to work, but not knowing your neighbors at all, as when in Europe you're, you know, in an apartment building with all the same people, same families that your grandparents lived with. You know, there's just so much mobility in our U.S. because of roads, and I think it's sad. But anyway, if any of you would comment on anything. 
So I would definitely agree and sort of um, in your scenario where you say technology can divide us. I would pose a question because in your scenario you say, you know, you exchange email, you exchange numbers and you communicate and then you find out the person can't spell, therefore you're not interested in them anymore. But in that scenario, the technology is just a tool that you, find, you use to find out the person can't spell. It's something that helps you to identify those problems earlier on, but the problem is still there outside of the technology. And so if the person can't spell, they write you a letter and you realize they can't spell. So the technology simply exposes the, the, the underlying problems much quicker than it would come out if the technology didn't exist. So in that respect, it's still sort of like, it's not necessarily the technology that's dividing us, it's just sort of exposing it and making it more visible. Hi, my name's Don Williams, and uh, I have a couple of general comments and then uh, uh, two, uh, two comments to uh, the two speakers. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, let me just uh, point out, uh, talking about the interstate, uh, that intentionally, State began in the 1950s, and that in this in Lansing as well as other cities, the, uh, including Detroit, the interstates were put through the black community, and and the uh, destro and destroyed the business communities in uh, African American uh, community uh, business business communities in those cities. And that was through uh, not only in Michigan, Chicago, uh, but uh, all throughout the South. So that uh, all of these things have been kind of subtle things that we're not necessarily aware of uh, that make the situation for us to gain wealth as a people uh, uh, very difficult, if not impossible at times. Uh, the second thing that I, I wanted to uh, uh, bring up is that, uh, and this is my address to, uh, for you, uh, uh, Professor Oscar, uh, in your discussion uh, about climate change, uh, I noted that you didn't uh, allude to the uh, economic interest of, of the uh, people who were resisting uh, climate change. And as I have heard about it, uh, that there's a high correlation between uh, the neo-confederate uh, parts of our country uh, where, uh, and those are the uh, uh, economies that depend on fossil fuels. Those are also the most racist, uh, still racist uh, uh, states. And, and so that race and all of the other issues play a factor, but I didn't hear you mention either of those. One of the books that I just come across is, uh, that I've been finding, Dog Whistle Politics uh, by uh, How co Coded Racial Appeals Have Reinvented Racism and Wrecked the Middle Class. This is a, a new book out by Ian Haney Lopez. He's a Harvard Law professor, and I think you, all of us, it, it's a very good book. I, I think you find it interesting. The final thing I wanted to come to for you, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, how, uh, I'm sorry, I can't make my glasses are that good, nor my eyes, but <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Bias, yes. uh, one of the things that you uh, mentioned about uh, race uh, was that you left out that in, in terms of genetics, the, uh, there are, f f in terms of the recent studies, there are only 14 uh, uh, human population groups in, in the world. Uh, this was in science about 2009, as I remember. And, and uh, that of those 14, only five are throughout the rest uh, of, of the world other than Africa. And that Africa has nine different population groups. That means that Africa has the most diverse population of any of the, of the continents and any of the uh, places that humans reside. So that when we talk that all blacks look alike, it's really that we're the most genetically diverse population. And coming back to your point, it would make even less sense 
that, that calling me black or white or whatever uh, is not something that is, as a physician, makes any sense at all. <clears throat> well, let me, since you mentioned me first, one of the reasons I didn't talk about some of these things is that I was told I only had eight minutes. But <laughs> the, um, I just want to make two, two comments. One is I grew up in Seattle. And when they started building I-5 down the west, down the coast, um, same thing happened. Minority communities just torn away, and that's where the freeway went. But in terms of economic impacts, it, it strikes me, I think you're, you're right, that the, the fossil fuel interests, the Koch brothers, the, you know, the oil place, oil uh, rich areas along the Gulf Coast and, and so forth, they have an economic interest. What really intrigues me, however, is the recurring argument that we hear around climate change and we hear around Obamacare, which is that, and the, and the way this gets sold, is that to be an American, you have to believe in free markets, no government control, and lots of, and just lots of ec unbridled economic growth, and the, a basic lack of care or interest in the environment. So I do think that a lot of the, um, there's a lot of money pouring in to fight the whole notion of doing anything about carbon, as we saw with the carbon tax uh, issues in the early Obama years. So it's clearly there's an economic motivation, but I think in a larger scale, this worldview, what divides people is that, you know, that somehow government is a bad thing to get involved in, in what we do. And, and I think that's a, a fundamental divide. You keep hearing it about, uh, you know, Obamacare, you, and it's, it's uh, I think it's permeated into a group of people. It's the same kind of argument that resonates for me when I hear people talk about their Second Amendment rights. You know, that somehow, if we have gun control, that government is somehow taking over the world. And so I think that it's a, at a worldview level, I just, I think that's, I think that's more generalizable than perhaps some of the uh, direct economic effects. So I think it's interesting that you brought up the history of the interstate highway system in, in, in this country and the effects that that had, the construction of the interstate highway system on some minority communities in this country. I think that there's a similar sort of race dynamic going on in Nicaragua. So I had mentioned that uh, the, the Pacific side of the country was colonized by the Spanish. So you have largely a Hispanic population on that side of the country, whereas on the Caribbean side you have a mixture of native uh, Indian people and also um, Afro-Caribbean people. Uh, and there's great animosity between those two sides of the country. And I guess if you're a cynic, and I'm not sure if I'm quite a cynic yet, but one could look at the situation and say that you know, these roads and the infrastructure that they're developing in Nicaragua is a way to sort of put their thumb on a population that uh, they've granted some autonomy to, but perhaps they think it was a mistake to do so. Uh, so by encouraging migration of the Hispanic population to the Caribbean side of the country, you know, they become more like us, I guess, and then perhaps better able to control. Uh, and again, I think there are voices in Nicaragua that, uh, that worry about that kind of dynamic. So um, regarding your, uh, your comments uh, about uh, genetic diversity in Africa, yeah, it's um, exactly, exactly that. Um, I, I wanted to avoid getting too much into the into the genetics of um, of African ancestry or something like that because it's uh, I, I'm always afraid of sort of perpetuating this idea that the, that the biological differences that exist between racial groups inside the United States as far as health health issues that those are somehow due to genetics as opposed to due to the arbitrary way that we treat each other. So um, yeah, I hear racism. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, racism. Um, so, so for example, I have a, I have a colleague uh, who wrote, um, Jonathan Kaplan, who wrote a nice paper saying that essentially that, um, that races become biologically real in the United States because we essentially racism them, them into existence. And so whatever genetic differences there might exist between African populations and non-African populations inside the United States, those might be measurable, but to say that they're significant for health issues is, uh, 
it's it, it's, it would be minuscule. But the way that we treat each other and and um, destroying neighborhoods, um, having having a much more difficulty of obtaining mortgages, uh, lower quality schools, um, having a hard time getting a paper published if you're an academic, all these sorts of issues, those come into play. And so we, um, we, we create these arbitrary distinctions between us and we name them races and we decide who counts as one. And so for example, in the United States, we have a black president even though we do and we don't. And and so we don't talk about like our our first like mixed race president. No, we talk about our first black president. So we have these ideas about who counts as black and who counts as white, or whether or not I count as count as Latino or whether I count as an American Indian because my my ancestors are from just a little north of those ones that you were talking about in there. <laughs> and so um, so we we use these arbitrary distinctions to, and, and the the effects become real. And so you see these disparities in life expectancy between African American populations and, and white populations in the United States. And it's not because there's genetic differences, it's because we, we, we racism them, them into existence. And it's amazing what we can what we can we can call into existence by by force of um, largely unintentional will, although sometimes intentional. So if I could be slightly controversial. I would argue Was that, that not enough? No, no, I'm going to push a little <laughs> bit further. I would argue that it's highly possible that President Barack Obama is not the first mixed race president. He's the first one that we openly acknowledge had parents from different races. Um, but if we think about the history of this country, there are very few purebred of any race in this country, especially if you're born in this country. So it, it gets back to, by law, no, by law, I'm sorry, by law, he's black, okay? He's, he's black by law, right? Th that's the way we've decided in this country. However, in reality, we know what happened on the plantations. We know what also just happens in life. And so we've had many mixed race presidents, just one that we all agree to. <laughs> well, if I could, could follow up from that, of course, since we're talking about race, we used to talk about race in this country quite quite differently as recently as a few generations ago insofar as we used to say that the Irish were a race or the Italians were a race and I previously mentioned Irish and Italians of course now when I was doing research in Philadelphia in what I had just assumed to be a white population so the variable I was most interested in was age and I was doing a study where I'd followed and in fact I'm still following some individuals as they as they grow older and um, so I was looking for a population that was otherwise as socially homogenous as possible. They all came from the same neighborhoods, they were at the same school, they were all women, and they were all white. And then I got to this school, and it was kind of like New York in the 1920s, in that there was a semi-racial divide between the Irish and the Italian groups in this school. Now, it's not the Philadelphia of these kids, parents or grandparents, right? The street fights between the Irish and the Italians don't happen. You can now marry an Italian if you're Irish and that's considered okay. But at this level of peer group structure, that's a very, is considered very salient among the teenagers and it was one of the main ways in which the white kids in the school divided themselves up. So it struck me as an outsider, as a non-American, someone who had, had never actually really thought about being Irish as being something so very separate. It's very surprising to me. It actually ended up becoming quite an important focus of my work, so I became very interested in ethnicity as a result. And how, if you're going to talk about lumpers and splitters, these young women were definitely splitters. Right? <laughs> definitely splitters. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, my, my name is Candace, and I'm from the Lansing community. I'm not associated with Michigan State University. Um, I saw the, uh, at Sun City Pulse, I saw this event, What Divides Us, What Unites Us, and I thought, I'm not doing anything. I'm going to go over there and listen. It's been very, very interesting. Um, what, uh, a couple things I'd like to say. Um, one of the examples I always give, uh, I'm an amateur photographer, is that I love to go on Flickr and look at pictures of the world because I'll never see all of the world. So I see it through other people's captures. And I feel that way when I listen to people like you. I'm never going to be able to delve into all the things that you talked about, and neither will you interactively. 
So uh, to me, as human beings, we that's what you know, so beautiful is that we can learn from each other. Um, the way I would describe myself, I feel <laughs> in many ways like a minority because um, the main topic and the main focus of my life and my energy and my volunteerism is peace. And when people hear the word peace, oh my God, the concepts that come out, you know, first of all, I am not.